Okay, so uh, I think what we're gonna do is do our presentation first and then we'll get to our normal business. And uh, because, uh, because of everything, I think we're gonna try to shorten the rest of the meeting, uh, you know, not get into long detailed conversations because uh, I don't wanna keep people too long. So uh, obviously, uh, as you know, uh, the, uh, the state is working on a, a TMDL for uh, a number of water bodies on Long Island that uh, will replace the, the former TMDL for 27 water bodies for shellfish, uh, you know, uh, shellfish pathogens. And uh, the DEC is trying to do it right better this time. And uh, part of that included uh, engaging the services of the USGS to, uh, to look at sources of uh, pathogens. And uh, Hempstead Harbor was honored to be one of the uh, the first that they looked at, and uh, we're uh, very pleased to have uh, Sean Fisher and uh, Tristan Tagliaferri here with us tonight to explain uh, the results of their study. Uh, I know it's, it's a, a long study, and, it, and it's probably hard to summarize it all in uh, ten or fifteen minutes. But uh, you know, at least we'll get a good good uh, feel for it. So, uh, who's going first, Tristan? Yeah, yeah, I'll go. Okay. Um, so uh, first of all, I appreciate you moving us to the beginning of the agenda tonight. I have a four month old that's already screaming. Oops. Uh, <laughs> she's waiting to be nursed to sleep. So, um, but I'm just gonna go through a little background of this, um, the larger study that we did, and then we'll just dive into some results specific to Hempstead. So um, this study was an assessment of fecal contamination using microbial source tracking methods in uh, seven endangerments throughout Long Island. Um, so it originated um, with the DEC saying we have a problem with fecal contamination in our surface waters. Um, it's a human health threat uh, for humans recreating in the water as well as eating contaminated shellfish. Um, and it is pervasive. So 92% of the DEC's uh, shell fishing waters are considered impaired for pathogens. Um, and they know this through their routine sampling for fecal coliform. Um, and it results in a lot of closures, uh, some year round, some seasonal. Uh, the, the maps on the right, I believe were um, closures that they just automatically do after a certain rainfall. Um, so, so that's, you know, that's become a problem. We want to be able to enjoy our waters and enjoy our shellfish. Um, but the issue with uh, just knowing whether or not there is fecal contamination is that you really don't know where it's coming from. So you know there's fecal coliform, but where is it coming from and who is it coming from? And the answers to those questions will really help you to um, solve the problem or make progress on that problem. So when we think about uh, fecal contamination entering our waterways, we think about a variety of factors. Um, so this is a list of them here. Groundwater discharge um, affected by cesspools and septic systems, stormwater runoff, watershed land use. So is it commercial? Is it residential? Is there high population density, low population density? Is it natural land? These all make a difference um, in how the water is affected. Um, tidal exchange and circulation. So we have water moving in and out twice a day, which certainly um, complicates things when you're thinking about where is this water coming from and where is it going. Uh, sediment resuspension uh, is something we looked at, and it might not always be the obvious thing to, to go to, but sediment can act as a sink for certain things. And when it's resuspended in the water column, it can act as a source uh, for pathogens uh, and direct discharge by wildlife and boats. Um, so you already went through uh, some DEC actions, the TMDLs for the 27 water bodies that were, that were prepared but need revision. Um, I do, I understand that those were primarily based on literature. So here we have some real science to help us to um, make better TMDLs uh, for pathogens um, using microbial source tracking, which I'll get 
pregnancy. Um, so our study, we looked at seven different embayments on Long Island, and each of these embayments are separated into its own report. So Hempstead Harbor has its own report for this microbial source tracking study. Um, and this link here on this page is the methods that we used for all seven embayments in the study. So this describes the laboratory methods, the microbial source tracking, um, analyses that we used, the quality assurance, um, how we did our data analysis. Uh, so this is an important paper uh, when reading the Hempstead Harbor report to understand the background on what we did um, and how we did it. And this is our study area. So these are all of the sites uh, that we looked at. Um, five of them were funded by the DEC. Lake Montauk out east was funded by the Concerned Citizens of Montauk, and the Great South Bay area there was funded by the Nature Conservancy. Um, but here we're going to just discuss uh, Hempstead Harbor for you guys. Uh, but I will say that when looking at all of these different embayments, they all were different. They all have different land uses, just different situations, different configurations, and, and we did find uh, different things in each, which is very interesting. Um, but for Hempstead Harbor, everything that we found, we wrote up in this report here. So this link will bring you to the Hempstead Harbor report, which is right now the only one that is actually published and citable. So uh, you can find this online and take a look at it. It has a lot more detail than what I'm going to show you today. Uh, so here's a map of the harbor. Uh, you can see we looked at um, sewered areas versus non-sewered areas. Uh, so the sewered area is shaded. Um, we're pointing out just some, some landmarks here. So you have a public beach on your left where we did take a sample where people recreate in the water. Um, you have a marina in the Glen Cove Creek. Uh, right by the Glen Cove Water Pollution Control Plant, plant which discharges um, water into the creek. And the picture to your right is uh, the outfall at uh, Glenwood Road. Um, if you'll see, it's a nice sunny day and the water is flowing. So one of the things we looked at was um, the differences in the water in wet and dry conditions. So our approach here was that we looked at it seasonally and we looked at it um, with the weather. So in the summertime, we would take a sample in wet, one sample in wet conditions, one sample in dry conditions, and we did the same in the winter. Um, and these samples were analyzed for uh, fecal coliform and uh, microbial source tracking um, methods, which were uh, bacteroides. So we, we looked in the water sample for different markers that would point to whether that water contained DNA from humans, from canines, or from ruminants like deer and waterfowl. I'm sorry, there was four markers. So, um, but like you can see here, it's a nice sunny day. This was a dry sample. Uh, we considered a dry sample to be uh, less than a quarter of an inch of rainfall in a 72 hour period. And you still see water flowing out of this outfall. Um, so that, that leads us to look at, well, is this really affected by stormwater or is it something else? And another thing to notice in this picture is the sediment. Um, you can see it's dark, it's muddy, it's rich and organic, which is gonna um, play a part in how that sediment can hold on to contaminants like pathogens. Uh, so here is a map of all the sites that we sampled. It is split into uh, Two different categories. So we have receptor samples, so which is the receiving water body, so Hempstead Harbor itself. Um, and those are the circles. 
and the diamonds show source samples. So um, any, any water coming out of an outfall or the Glen Cove Creek, for example, we considered a source uh, site because it did have the marina and the, the, Glen, the water pollution control plant outfall. Um, so that's how our graphs are split up. Um, and the picture here, you're looking at the very uh, southern part of the harbor. So this is the pond culvert in Hempstead Harbor South. And it might be hard to see, but there is an outfall um, flowing and draining ponds behind it. So these are the figures that we have in our report. Um, they have a lot of information on them. This is uh, the human marker, HF183. So this shows um, whether or not we found the human marker and how much of it. So it does quantify the amount of the marker that we found. Uh, the, top, the top part is the receptor samples. So that's within the embayment. And the bottom box are the source samples. And it's showing you wet and dry. So each dot is colored. Um, orange is dry and blue is wet. And then it also is showing you the season. So summer is shaded green, winter is white, sediment is the brown shading, and groundwater is the red shading. Um, so one thing to take away here, if you'll just notice the concentration. So if you look at the bottom, the first one on the bottom is Colbert at Glenwood Road, and you have very high concentrations in the winter of uh, the human marker. Uh, same thing for Glen Cove Creek. Um, and then if you look at the top of the receptors, it's orders of magnitude less, right? So that's kind of showing us like this is where these markers are likely coming from. Um, and the correlation of these markers with fecal coliform um, is something else that's not shown on this graph, but it's very important to look at. Um, it is described in the report, and it, it's, the data is there in tables in the report. Because um, it can get a little, it can get a little complicated. Not just because you have a marker does not mean that you're contributing fecal coliform. And we found this um, in groundwater, where. Um, and even in studies throughout Long Island, we do not see very much um, bacteria in groundwater, but you do have groundwater influence. So you can see high nitrates, you can see pharmaceuticals, you can, which we didn't see in this study, but you can find the influences of groundwater. And here uh, we did at the culvert north of Tavern Beach, we did find uh, a human marker, but I don't believe it was associated with any fecal coliform. Um, so as a source of fecal coliform, that's, that's not going to be it. Uh, similarly with uh, Glen Cove Creek, um, you find high concentrations of the human marker, um, but you do not find equally high concentrations of fecal coliform. And we've seen this in other areas of uh, sewage treatment plants that we have sampled. And the rationale that I have for that is that they're being treated efficiently so that um, you're not finding the bacteria in the water, but you are finding the DNA, the human DNA that is discharged um, through that outfall. Um, so moving on, this is uh, the canine marker. Um, and you can see that it is, it is also present. Um, in the receptor and the source um, in both seasons and in all kinds of weather. Um, so this is, yeah, not in groundwater and not in the sediment. Uh, the waterfowl was actually interesting because you can see it's only found in the winter. So all of our detections were found in the winter months. Uh, one reason for this could be just 
the way that um, waterfowl behave in the winter months, so they tend to congregate. Um, and that just makes for a really good sample. So um, that marker may not be present when they're all dispersed, but when they get together and they, you know, you take that sample, then it, then it really hits. And you can see that here in both wet and dry weather. So um, one thing that we did with all this data is we looked at each site and we looked at the potential sources of fecal contamination. And this top um, table here, which is in the report, um, shows an X where we think that it is a potential contributor of fecal contamination in the harbor. Um, and then the remarks next to it just give, give the thought process behind that. So, um, you know, for example, Holbert at Glenwood Road, groundwater is not thought to be a potential contributor of fecal contamination, but stormwater conveyances and sediments are. We did see um, effects of stormwater and we did see that um, the sediment could act as a source when we suspend it. So um, this list is in the report. It's kind of an easy way to look at it if you're looking at a particular location. Um, and then you can reference it with the actual data uh, in the appendix. So the table below this, um, this shows our classification system, which is described in the methodology report. And basically, all the way on the right, if you see, look at the class numbers, we rated the sites from one to five with one being the most contaminated site and five being the least. And we looked, that's where we brought people coliform in. So we looked at whether we found human markers or human and canine markers. And if the fecal coliform was above um, 49 MPN per 100 milliliters, uh, which is a standard um, that is used for, for the shellfishing classifications, then we assigned it uh, to a class. So you can see Glenwood Road, um, the outfall at Skillman Street and Glen Cove Creek are all rated a class one. Um, with others, the spillway at Skillman Street right next to it is a class four, um, you know, water coming from a completely different place. Um, and that is all described um, in text in the report as well. So you can read about each individual site. Um, so just to summarize, um, and it, it is a lot to, to put into a short presentation, but um, we are seeing continuous inputs of human fecal contamination in Hempstead Harbor in dry weather. So you saw the Glen, Glenwood Road outfall, it was flowing in dry weather. So there's a constant source. So it is not just stormwater. However, stormwater is certainly an important conveyance. And we do see um, some higher fecal coliforms when stormwater pushes that water through and out. Um, groundwater is not a likely contributor, uh, like I said before, uh, just because we don't think that the, um, the bacteria makes its way it, the bacteria gets filtered out through the sediment, but while we, you know, before it makes its way into the embayment, not to say that it's not affected by groundwater in other ways, but um, as far as fecal coliform, we don't believe so. Um, sediment can act as a source, particularly the type of sediment that you see in Hempstead Harbor. Um, and some of our other embayments, the sediment that we collected is much more sandy. And we did not have the same results as we did in Hempstead Harbor. So the sediment type uh, certainly seems to matter. Um, and then just to just to clarify all of this, um, this is really a small sample size, even though we took hundreds of samples um, throughout this study because it was spread out over a broad area. We had seven embayments across the whole island. Um, so, you know, in theory, we really only had one sample of each type in each site. So one winter wet, one winter dry, one summer wet, one summer dry. Um, 
So by looking at the island as a whole, um, you know, if we pulled all that data together, it might tell us uh, something, just give us more confidence in, in how we're looking at this. But as far as um, Hempstead Harbor, looking at it from the data that we collected from Hempstead Harbor, that's all summarized in the report. Um, I can send the links if, if that is needed or helpful. Um, and we're certainly here for any questions. Um, if you do get to go through that and you have, you know, anything to ask or need any clarification, we're always here. So thank you. Just in the, uh, it's Eric. I, I have a question in looking out through the report. Mm -hmm. uh, you said the, uh, the outfall at uh, Skillman Street said it might be pond related. Uh, the only pond that I'm aware of is is like a uh, a stormwater pond that was cre created recently at, for a condo complex that's adjacent to uh, to Skillman Street. Is that the pond that you're referring to? The pond I was referring to, uh, or what I meant to say anyway, was the the ponds behind. Um, what is what road is that? The pond the pond culvert at Hempstead Harbor South. That's actually shown in this picture. Behind that road, I believe there are ponds. If I'm not oh, you're talking about uh, old, old Northern yeah. Boulevard. I'm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's what I that's what I meant to say. Yeah, but, the outfall and the spillway at Skillman Street were were very different. Um, but they're adjacent to each other. So if it's coming from that pond, which is maybe you know several hundred yards further to the south, wouldn't it, wouldn't it affect both of those uh, locations? Yeah, well, the, the spill, well, one of them, and Sean, if you want to jump in here, I know one of them, I think it was the spillway at Skillman Street looked very new. And I, it looked as though that might have been collecting uh, more stormwater than the outfall, which, you know, it's hard to tell where these outfalls are really coming from. Um, but that has been there a very long time. So um, I don't think the water coming out of those was necessarily the same. Yeah, I think that spillway was rebuilt. But, you know, one of the things I didn't see mentioned in here, and that affects that spillway as well as uh, the uh, uh, Glenwood Road, uh, you know, uh, drain, is that there, there are a lot of underground springs. Uh, that are, are are feeding into those, uh, and I see you. You've mentioned stormwater versus groundwater. Are those underground springs are you are you including those in the groundwater, or how or how how did you uh, factor those in? Well, when I when I was talking about groundwater, I'm really just referring to the the groundwater that we did sample. So the two sites on this map um, that are in green, the Tappan Beach and the beach south of Glen Cove Creek. Um, we, we drove a piezometer into the ground here to, to find the fresh groundwater just below the surface. So that's the groundwater that we analyzed. Um, as far as looking at whether water coming from the outfalls had groundwater in it, we did do an isotope analysis, um, which, you know, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to say. It's hard to say, really. But um, yes, the you know it is understood that it does drain. Um, there are underground springs, and there's you know different ponds and, and such that is draining out of those outfalls. Um, and it's you know it's evidence in um, the markers found in those outfalls. I mean, you find waterfowl coming out of out of there. You know, so. Um, and that's coming from somewhere. That's coming from where the birds are. So, and you know, we didn't see any birds in Hempstead Harbor. So, <laughs> um, I don't know. How, I don't know how well that answers your question. Okay. Yeah, I just wondered if, if you considered factoring in those streams because I think that's a lot of the flow. You know, especially a power at we call powerhouse drain. It, the uh, Glenwood Road outfall uh, is a piped you know former stream and actually there was a big pond there uh, that was filled in so there's a lot of flow that comes through there and it's very possible that some of the homes may be illicitly connecting into that uh 
piping system, so but well, we don't know. Uh, right. Right. Yeah, that's an absolute possibility that that's that's occurring because you you know you you're finding human markers all over. Um, so, yeah, we we've been you know struggling trying to find where the bacteria is coming from at the uh, Glenwood Road and, and also in uh, in Glencoe Creek. But uh, you know, we've tried. Uh, we, that's why we appreciate this study. It gives us a little bit more, uh, you know, definition as to what's happening out there. But uh, you know, we still don't know the sources uh, really, uh, where, where the uh, whether it's uh, illicit connections. One thought is that maybe at the uh, you know, Glenwood Road, that it, it might be possible to send some cameras up there and see if there's illicit connections. Uh, I don't know how feasible that is. It's, it's a pretty long uh, stretch, but uh, I don't. Have you had experience with uh, doing that kind of tracing? I, I have not. I know we. I know initially in the beginning of the study we talked about using dogs. Uh, you know, fecal contamination sniffing dogs to find like you know actual sources and illicit connections. But ultimately. Um, you know, when the study was designed, it just became a very broad um a very broad analysis so that this information you know it's not it's not finding the exact it's not digging deep into one location um which is you know it's unfortunate when if that's what you're looking for you know but given the resources the dec had they preferred to spread it out over the five locations um, rather than focus intensely on one, because then that would have been, you know, that would have given us more resources to tackle that sort of question. One thing that's also been tried in uh, Oyster Bay and Cold Spring Harbor is a fairly new technology is using thermal imaging uh, cameras on drones that uh, if you don't do it in, in the, the spring, you know, early in the morning, you can see slight temperature differences uh, in different locations uh, going down to, to somewhat of a depth. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I don't know that we're just trying to find ways that we can go further than what you've done to try to isolate what the, the sources are. Right. Yeah, Eric, actually, um, sorry, Tristan, did I cut you off? No, you have to go. No, that's fine. I am going to I am going to run everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present and I'll leave you with Sean and feel free to, um, to email or whatnot. Do you need the presentation, Sean? Or are you good? No, I'm good. I can uh, I can go off it. And if anything, I have I have it, too. So I'll just put it up if, if we need to reference it. All right. Okay, great. Thank you. And Sean, All right, if you need to later. do it, I, I need to make you a co-host if you want to do that. Sure. If, yeah, no problem. Um, so yeah, Eric, I just wanted to jump on that, the, uh, the idea of the, the thermal imaging, right? So we actually were working on a separate project with the New York City DEP, um, microbial source tracking at Alley Creek. So, you know, just, uh, just a couple uh, bays over and um, um, Little Neck Harbor, not so much inland Little Neck Harbor, but we were really focused the particular sources um, at their outfalls. And one of the things DEP did was we, they worked with a, a consultant that had the flyover drones, right? And um, they did exactly what you said. They went out in the winter and they saw little bits of, um, you know, temperature differences that implied groundwater was contributing. And the, the elevation differences kind of imply that that would have happened anyway. But what was interesting is in particular near one of their newer um, retention tanks for, uh, to prevent CSO overflows, they had groundwater like seeping in from under it. So it would have, it may have appeared that, you know, the thing was flowing or there could have been um, sources from there, but, you know, we also have a, a handheld um, um, thermal imaging camera that we took out there too. Um, this way we can kind of get right up on it and, um, and, and try to look for subtle differences. And it's, you know, if, if you don't have that, there's always uh, multi handheld multi-parameter SONs that you could use with temperature sensors, like a thermistor. And, you know, it's a little more tedious to go around um, at like uh, mid tide or or wherever, but you know you can get similar results uh, if you're if you're kind of focusing around a specific area where you feel uh, septic influence may be an issue. You know, well, we're trying to go back from the uh, from the outfall and see where it's getting into the outfall. Yeah, yeah. So in that case, you know, you're all underground, and uh, yeah, with all the high hits for the um, human human marker, it was uh, 
you know, not, not that it was necessarily surprising, but you know, it, was, it was orders of magnitude higher than um, most other places. And, and in fact, it was kind of on par with, you know, diluted um, plant effluent, you know, when you're downstream of the, uh, of the Glen Cove sewage treatment plant outfall. So, um, you know, from the DEC's perspective of, of using these data, it kind of helps them hone in on, on a few of the locations that they feel are most um, pressing to address. Whereas, you know, the, um, the spillway and, and the outfall at Skillman Street, the outfall um, is actually that pipe that kind of diverts and, and drains um, some of that water from, that either is infiltrating or, or is, you know, kind of leaking in from the, from, from the shallow aquifer and then just constantly discharging through that, I guess, 12 inch um, green pipe. You know, that tends to have elevated concentrations of bacteria, but without knowing where that is sourced from, whether it's a co combination of, um, you know, storm, storm drains or, or upgrading ponds, then it's, it's hard to know, you didn't necessarily get hits for, you know, human markers that often either, um, whereas we had more in the way of, um, you know, we had similar canine and, and waterfowl. Yeah, well, you know that you had some elevated dog markers at that location, and there's a dog park uh, right next to there. Mm -hmm. So I, I yeah. suspect that it's coming from there. Yeah, and that spillway is the new, the new, um, the new kind of diversion that you had that you had described, right, with the cement. And um, we took a set yeah. sample right there too. Um, we didn't see much in the way of um, markers, but you know, again, the sediment resuspension is something that's been, you know, over the last five ten years has been been uh, researched by folks in the city. Uh, you know, Greg Mullen, his college, and and some folks along. Well, Hudson River, um, and then we were also looking at it in Alley Creek more closely too. Yeah, I, I want to give other people a chance to to ask questions. Sure. But did I, did I hear you say that the uh, human markers are orders of magnitude higher in Hempstead Harbor than the other six? Um, they are definitely higher. I was saying that I was comparing the Hempstead Harbor, the source markers at Cling, uh, Culver and Cling, Wood Road to the other um, source locations. Oh, okay. Um, but on whole, as a whole, um, these concentrations are some of the highest we've seen um, across the island, and um, not necessarily Alley Creek. We've seen them at Alley Creek, but that's more urbanized as well. And um, you know, as these uh, as the other reports come out, um, you'll be able to compare. And that's um, you know, for just for context, I know we didn't get too much into the methodology and the and the science behind these markers, but um, the idea is that. The, the ability to compare within the markers and use human markers concentrations to compare to other human marker concentrations across uh, space and, and time is really the, the best utility for it. Unfortunately, and, and I, I answered the question from, um, from Stephen in the, in the chat, there's no MST marker method that currently exists that would allow for a direct comparison of concentrations of markers to concentrations of bacteria. We can look at relative distributions of the different markers um, and then compare how much human is in, at one site relative to human at another, um, and, and then also compare the relative contributions of, say, canine and waterfowl and see what is most implicated for those particular sources, and then look at concentrations of bacteria as a whole and see where, um, where we can, where it would be most advantageous to focus if human sources are um, predominant and could be addressed, you know, and should be addressed because that's something that DEC takes seriously in terms of addressing, um, um, you know, illicit or, or um, illicit hookups or, or failing infrastructure, um, cracks in, in, in storm sewer lines that cause um, adjacent storm um, septic or sewage to, to infiltrate in and then discharge. So. I'll, uh, yeah, happy to take any other questions. Anybody else? I guess your uh, presentation uh, gave everybody the information they needed. So thank, thank you very <laughs> much. 
Yeah, yeah, sure thing. And, and like Tristan said, you know, either one of us or, or both of us, you know, feel free to reach out, um, email, or, or I think some, some folks have uh, our phone numbers. We're happy to provide any more information. Um, the Alley Creek report, I'm hoping will be out by, uh, by next year. It, oh, we're drafting it now. So that'll be another uh, Long Island Sound relevant um, mm. report. Port Jeff and Conscious Bay is also slated to be released uh, within the next few months. And, and also feel free to reach out to us. I mean, obviously uh, we have a lot of local knowledge that uh, may be able to, to help you in the future if you're doing some more work in our area. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, we were in touch throughout this um, and, you know, the DEC had their, um, their harbor surveys that they had completed the, uh, and, and we use those as references as well. So yeah, it was, uh, it was great working on this, this area. Okay. All right. Th thank you. You're welcome to stay. I mean, we do have uh, to get back to our, uh, our regular meeting. Sure, sure. I appreciate it. I'm going to uh, jump off and, and get the kids to bed. So thanks. Talk to you all later. Okay. All right. I'm sharing my screen with the uh, final agenda. So uh, I guess we, we do have a quorum. So uh, the next item of business would be to uh, approve the, uh, the meeting minutes from the uh, September meeting. Has anybody had a chance to take a look at them? Does anybody have any questions, changes, corrections? And if not, then I'll entertain a motion to uh, accept them. You might be muted, people. I'll make a motion to accept the minutes, Eric. Uh, and who's that? Adam Levine. Oh, Adam, okay. Is there a second? I'll second Dan Fucci. Dan, thank you, Dan. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay, well, the minutes, <coughs> minutes are approved. Uh, on the uh, shellfish population survey for Hempstead Harbor, uh, since the last meeting, uh, we had another meeting with DEC. We asked them to reconsider. We, uh, we did go back and forth a little bit and they have uh, agreed to, re to uh, now allow us to do the, uh, the, the, the shellfish population survey in the entire harbor, including the uh, underwater lands that are under state control. Uh, so we've been in touch. We've given the go ahead to Cash and Associates. Uh, I know they want to do it this month. Uh, haven't heard the date yet, but uh, they are working on getting it together. And uh, you know, hopefully, we can get that wrapped up fairly soon. I know one of the items is the town of North Hempstead because some of those underwater lands are uh, under the jurisdiction of North Hempstead. I know Kevin's been working on getting the uh, town's permission. So Kev, do you have do you have an update? Yeah, um, I got it on the town board agenda. I just have to check to see if it passed. Uh, I'm sure it did, uh, but I just I have to follow up. I, I I don't know if the board meeting's tomorrow or it was already, but it was on the agenda. Okay, I mean obviously uh, we we like to have that done you know in hand uh, before uh, Greg starts. So uh, just let me know. Well, if worst comes to worst, from what I understand, we can give you a notice to proceed okay. and the access agreement can come later. Um, but as long as the board votes on it, it's uh, it should be a go. That sounds good. Thank you, Kevin. All right, on the uh, member dues, I'm uh, happy to uh, announce that uh, all of our nine municipalities are, are paid in full for the year. So uh, we are good. So thank you, everybody, on that. On the uh, Marcelino grant, which is we are administering for the three, uh, you know, protection committees for water monitoring, uh, we did have a meeting since the last uh, our last meeting with DEC, and they would like to see us uh, spend down the remaining funds, uh, and have advised that they'd be willing to entertain 
a, a, a grant extension for one year. So we've applied for that. Uh, I'm, I'm sure they're gonna give it to us, but we haven't heard officially on that. Uh, they did wanna know for the, even though we've spent the vast majority of the funds out, you know, uh, allocated for Hempstead Harbor, uh, they wanted to know specifically what we wanted to spend the remaining funds uh, on. And they're in two categories. One is for contractual services and one is for equipment. So on the contractual services, they did tentatively agree to uh, reimburse uh, the Coalition of Safe Hempstead Harbor for 2020 for the, uh, their additional cost to charter a second boat that which was necessary to keep social distancing during the uh, COVID situation. Uh, it wasn't a lot of money, I think it was $675 or so. Uh, and uh, we submitted that to them. We're waiting for final approval on that. The remainder of the contractual uh, services money uh, will go to reimburse me for my time. And then for the uh, equipment, uh, remaining equipment funds, uh, they did give, uh, you know, uh, conceptual approval to purchasing a, uh, a uh, laser printer that will allow uh, the coalition to print uh, uh, sheets on uh, waterproof paper for doing their uh, water monitoring and also to purchase an underwater camera uh, that will help in trying to identify different sources and that sort of thing. Uh, since then, uh, I, I don't know if Carol wants to speak, but you've had a little problems getting uh, the uh, equipment you originally uh, priced out and uh, because of supply problems that Carol, do you want to uh, elaborate a little bit? Yes, just that we had looked at, I mean, it's, it's just a, a lot of details in trying to uh, get what we needed, which was more than uh, for just the waterproof paper, but also for the quantity of printing we're going to have to do, especially there are some changes going on with the annual report that we're still working out uh, for 2021. Which is and the data, the amount of data that we print out, comparisons that we do in the graphing, and uh, would necessitate a, a laser printer. When we went to actually order it, everything's out of stock. Anything comparable to the capabilities we needed were out of stock. The one model we thought we were going to be able to get was much more expensive, and uh, we ordered it. We thought there was one, and we found out the next day. It was out of stock. So we actually have nothing right now. So all we're looking to do is uh, get an okay from DEC for, you know, I, I hope they could be flexible for whatever we need uh, to uh, reimburse for the amount of water monitoring use of that equipment. And it shouldn't matter to them whether it's a brother or a Xerox or whatever. Um, but right now we have nothing. I'm thinking the same thing is going to happen. We haven't even started trying for the underwater camera. But from what I'm hearing, there are serious supply issues for many, many items. Um, so we'll see. But, you know, we're, we're looking more to what is needed. And, uh, you know, we'll be flexible, as I said, as long as we can get the capabilities we need. Right. Yeah, I, I don't I don't anticipate a problem. It's just uh, it was a little bit different than what we had discussed over the phone and uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, given to them in writing. So I, I think as long as we all touch base and we all agree, I think they should be fine with that. So mm -hmm. uh, on the uh, shellfish seeding grant uh, through uh, Congressman Swazi, uh, that is dependent upon the uh, passage of the federal budget which uh, has still not happened. Uh, the, they're right now on a continuing resolution. Uh, we're hoping that uh, they pa pass a, a budget fairly soon, but as you've been following the news, there's a lot of back and forth with their uh, infrastructure, uh, pro you know, uh, bills that are going back and forth. So we will see hopefully soon uh, because we really need to order the shellfish by late the end of this year, beginning of next year in order for the hatcheries to produce it in order to do the seeding uh, in next fall. So uh, we'll just have to stay tuned on that. That's really out of our control. Uh, on the uh, water quality 
Carol, do you want to give a, uh, a brief update? Sure. Um, we were just out today. Uh, it was a very high tide, so we're able to do a survey of the entire harbor, lower and upper. We have three more weeks for the core program, and, um, and we're continuing to do the tap and monitoring. Um, we are also doing the shoreline sampling. Um, we're, today was bacteria, but we're still collecting the nitrogen samples on a biweekly basis. Uh, two more weeks for the nitrogen collection uh, for the summer season. The winter monitoring will start on about November 13th because we go through, as I said, the rest of October uh, for the summer season. Uh, today, what we found was unusually clear water at three stations. Um, and it was really about two to two and a half meters. Uh, there also the new bulkhead by the STP, by this uh, sewage treatment plant um, is nearing completion. They have a bypass for the outfall the, and outflow from the outfall until they can extend the outfall pipe. Um, so it's a pretty big mechanism of three pipes actually diverting that flow from the plant into the harbor. Um, and there is also, we're waiting to see how, how this will affect also that pipe number nine, which is uh, adjacent to the um, STP outfall. That's been covered at this point. They also have to uh, put a hole into the new bulkhead, extend the pipe for that. The new bulkhead goes up to the fence line of the property that begins with the cove restaurant. So that huge outfall on the corner of that bulkhead um, is not covered over by a new bulkhead. Um, that's still just a very small piece of old bulkhead. They stopped at the uh, property of the sewage treatment plant. Um, we've been seeing huge schools of bunker throughout the harbor finning. Um, we're seeing some unusual behavior that again I'll have to report uh, to DEC where uh, today in the creek, some of the bunker that we saw very large, very large schools, uh, but some of them seem to be on their side swimming. So it seems to be indicative again of some influence of some kind of a virus. Uh, we've seen a few dead fish, not again, not anything of significance. And again, because of the huge population, you would expect to see some large ones. You see every bird in the harbor, practically with uh, a bunker. Um, so they're having a good time with it. Um, and, I, and I also today we saw an adult and juvenile bald eagle. And then this was the first peregrine falcon we saw on Glavsky's crane, I guess in about two years. It's been since we saw one, so. So they must have a nest nearby, that's great. Um, I haven't seen it. It was, as I said, I haven't seen a, a, fal a peregrine falcon in a couple of years, but this one definitely, uh, you could tell it was, and it stayed around on, on the crane for a while. So, and the what? Oh, the, a lot of sea anemones um, by, the, um, by Safe Harbor docks. That was unusual last week. So the USW is also proceeding till the end of October. And we're already thinking about having to uh, get the, the equipment back to save the sound, which actually they're moving to Larchmount with a brand new office and a big brand new lab. So I think some of the um, chlorophyll uh, filter testing and analysis will be done by them instead of IEC eventually. And I think that's, that's about it for the uh, water monitoring. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, on the uh, Scudder's Pond Weir, I have some, uh, some pretty good news. Uh, Nassau County Legislator Delia DeRiggi Witten uh, has uh, put in a request in the, in the next uh, Nassau County budget for $200,000 uh, to, to, to build the, the new weir. Uh, 
at the pond. Uh, she's pretty optimistic that uh, it will be included. And uh, so we're, we're crossing our fingers and uh, that will be the, the last piece of the puzzle on the, uh, the Scudder's Pond uh, restoration project that we did. So uh, on the uh, nine element plan, Dan, is there anything new? No, there's, there's really nothing new. I'm still uh, working with Dr. Goldbler and um, uh, the folks at SUNY Stony Brook, <clears throat> but there really has been nothing new uh, for the last few weeks. Uh, the county's been bogged down with uh, storm problems, so uh, we, we really haven't had the time to really uh, do as much as we want with it. We, we just position, uh, but hopefully, <clears throat> I'm trying to get another hire to help me out so hopefully by the end of the year there'll be another another person on board but you know i can't say that for sure but we're trying um but no i, I don't really have anything new i'm working on uh uh the one, the one thing i would ask from the, the committees is um <clears throat> if any information you may have and i think i may have mentioned this at the last meeting or at the uh, manhasset bay i believe uh, anything on bio extraction uh plans or or thoughts that the townships or the committees that uh, uh would be uh, wanting to pursue would be helpful because we we do want to add that as uh as something in our element plan for niches reduction so yeah it, it did and the county up. really is not going to have a pro i'm it, sorry it, go ahead eric yeah it, it did come up at our last meeting and, and steve coaster was was going to get you the information the uh the, the, the town of Oyster Bay is, uh, is working on a, a very large scale yeah, yeah. Uh, kelp uh, growing project where uh, they're going to use all their marinas, including uh, Tappan Marina. Uh, and, uh, and some yeah, of the great. Oyster Bay that's about three quarters of a mile of, uh, of line growing kelp. And then uh, they plan to dry it uh, and then use it in town parks as a fertilizer. So <laughs> it's. It, it's, it's, it's a good project and the, they're underway. And I don't know, Sarah, do you, do you have anything, do you, are you involved with that? Do you have any other things to add to that? Um, I'm not currently involved with it, but I do know that the project is happening. And um, if I am present at the next meeting, I will be sure to provide uh, an update on the project and what's been going on. Um, in terms of that, I know that bio extraction grant that's available, is that what you're referring to? Uh, we're, that, we're not referring to that, but that's good to know. Yeah, so we, we offered our support for anyone that's applying for that, any academic institution, and um, have extended that we are more than happy to help, um, whether that's um, testing out new types of algae and kelp in um, town waters, because we certainly have already established a protocol for um, hanging up the lines and everything. We can certainly do more um, depending on interest. Can you uh, work with uh, Steve and get that information, a description of what the town is doing to uh, to, to Dan Cucci? Sure, absolutely. I'm making note of it now. Yeah, great, great. I appreciate that. Sure. Uh, also, I know the nine element plan is going to really rely on the protection committees uh, with the uh, uh, public education portion of uh, you know fertilizer reduction strategies. Uh, because I know that was a, a large uh, push from the stakeholders uh, to really deal with fertilizer reduction. And the DEC uh, gave us an indication that uh, a major push in, in doing that would be through educational and educational components. So I, I know the county uh, is really going to have a, uh, a want the protection committees to really take uh, take as much of the lead as possible on that um so so i just wanted them to, to put that out there as well yeah we can definitely assist in that and maybe even the uh soil and water conservation district might be able to do a webinar and that kind of thing so sure we'll, we'll, okay we'll, yeah that would we'll put together a, a program on that for sure uh, okay, okay great i and think at the last i know uh Hopefully in the next two years, uh, I think the goal is to have 200 IA systems, uh, sep alternative septics uh, in, uh, installed. Hello? Yes. 
uh, yeah, in, in the next two years, I know the county's goal is to have uh, 200 of the, the, system, the new innovative systems installed. Uh, so, you know, we have to work on, on timelines over, over a longer period of time. That's part of the nine element program. Well, you know, get to basics, how many, how many uh, systems might, might be installed in five years or 10 years. So those are numbers that we're gonna have to, you know, incorporate into the nine element plan as well. And we always put the caveat in there that, well, you know, a lot of this is uh, dependent upon, uh, the nine element plan is not mandatory, uh, but, but, you know, a lot of it is, is a, essentially a wish list, but it, it comes down to funding. To uh, to get us there, so yeah. Just so you know, this sort of dovetails with the uh, the last bullet in this this part of the uh, agenda. But uh, the uh, Soil and Water Conservation District, which is administering the IA uh, program, as you know, uh, has over a hundred applications already uh, for the towards the two hundred that uh, you know the right. funding is available for. And I think there's I think there's already thirty five signed uh, installation contracts. Uh, but some of that is being held up waiting for uh, certain things to happen. But uh, so I think that's happening. Uh, you Great. know, uh, the, the, the 200, and this is just since May that we've gotten over a uh, hundred applications. So some of them may drop out as people, you know, uh, you know, normally do in situations like this uh, when they find out more information about it, it's, you know, maybe doesn't cover all the costs yeah. and all that, but uh, it's off to a very good start. Uh, you know, we just got there's some administrative issues that uh, need to be addressed and uh, and are being addressed. So uh, it's just uh, everything takes time, and uh, I think it's I think that's a realistic goal. Eric, do, do you know if there's going to be another day where vendors are going? Yeah, to sounds, sounds good. Uh, there's nothing's been talked about yet. That was that was done by uh, the North Shore Land Alliance and Friends mm -hmm. of the Bay, and it was very successful. So uh, I would imagine that, uh, you know, it's very feasible to do another one, but probably not in the winter uh, because right. it's really an outdoor thing. But, uh, you know, that's, the, I'm sure uh, Kat Kaufman from uh, North Shore Land Alliance is, uh, I'm sure she's thinking along those lines. Yeah. So, all right, the next item on the agenda, moving a little quickly, is is the uh, the TMDL, and that, that, I think that's no, I'm not aware of anything new that's happened, uh, other than the uh, USGS report, and, and we just heard about that. So I don't think there's unless anybody else knows anything, uh, I think we've covered that one. All right, and then uh, addressing bacteria in the powerhouse drains of watershed, we sort of touched on that also in the USGS report. Uh, I'm not sure there's, if there's anything else to report at this point. Uh, I, I know, Dan, we, we talked at one point about some of this uh, state money that's uh, from the uh, Grumman settlement that might be able to be applied towards this. Is, is any, do you know of anything, any more discussions on that? I personally have, have not heard anything uh, on that. Uh, I could. I could I could ask Brian Schneider to see if there's anything on that, but I, I haven't heard any updates on that. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing would be is similar to what happened in uh, in uh, Crescent Beach is that we need a, a consultant, an engineer, to to look at what's feasible in terms of an end of the pipe, uh, you know, yeah. treatment. If it is at all, all feasible, I mean, that would seem to be the easiest thing. Uh, you know, if we don't know exactly where the sources are, but uh, Obviously, we should look at uh, ways to, to trace back and find those sources as well. So uh, all that is really, you know, engineering related. So if this, and, and obviously engineering is costly. So uh, if there's a source of money and we could come up with a plan to, to study it, that would be, uh, that would be great. All right. Uh, back okay, to I'll, I'll, uh, Yeah, I'll bring it to the Thank you. All right, and then uh, bacteria issues in Glen Cove Creek. Carol, Rocco, Dan, anything new? Not new, it's just uh, still the mystery of trying to figure out what's really going on, even with the addition of the USGS study. I mean, they're also 
confirming the high levels you know, of bacteria. Um, and just if you read the full report, I don't know how far you got into it, uh, Eric, but they're you know, saying that they didn't see any uh, connection with bacteria coming from the marina. Because right. at one point that was considered a potential source. It's mostly from stormwater. And, um, you know, Rocco and I have discussed it. Rocco even got the engineers in to look at some of the, again, what the USGS report was, was highlighting were these outfalls that have constant flow. And, um, you know, Ro the engineers told Rocco, this is how they're supposed to work. And I understand that. Problem is why are there instances where you're getting what we would call exceedances? Again, when we say that, all we have to go by are beach closure uh, standards. Um, you know, and it's primarily after a certain amount of rainfall. So something else beyond a groundwater is draining out. Um, but this has been problematic and it's for the entire creek. But I would say when we get the highest numbers, it's pretty much all outflows that you'll you'll see you know these um, higher numbers. At some point when we try to parse all of this out at the end of the season, um, I'd like to you know get back in touch with uh, Tristan and Sean to ask them about you know again this connection if there is any between fe fecal coliform, which is what they were looking at. And the shellfish standards, but what we're seeing is a reversal. We're generally getting higher enterococci numbers than fecal. Generally, that's been happening happening over a, a pretty long period of time now, where we saw this switch. So there's a lot to parse out. It's very complicated, uh, and that's you know that's pretty much all we can say at this point. I know that the Sea Cliff Yacht Club is trying to get approval for um, having a certified beach in front of the yacht club. And they have a consultant doing bacteria testing. They're using a different methodology, which complicates things. They're using enter alert and uh, they're getting high, very high numbers. So I've had conversations with the health department. Everybody's trying to figure out what's going on. Okay, thank you. All right, I, on the uh, septic program, the only other thing to mention is that uh, one of the uh, issues that's come up is that the, uh, the county, in order to spend county money, uh, which uh, is uh, where the, the funds are coming from, both county money and state money, which the county administers, is that uh, they in require that the installers have a Nassau County home improvement license and not only have a home improvement license, but have the, uh, the right type of insurance. In other words, the insurance policy covers septic installation. And uh, even though the, the permits uh, are not issued by the county, they're issued by the towns and the villages and the villages may have different uh, requirements and not require a Nassau County home improvement license, but that that's been a little bit of a, you know, a hang up and that, uh, you know, so the, uh, the Soil and Water Conservation District went out with a soft uh, release of a uh, request for expressions of interest this week uh, to contractors that have been identified that may fit that requirement as of having a home improvement license with the necessary insurances. And we've gotten some responses to that. Uh, and there's, you know, obviously when you go out with something like this, you get a lot of questions, things you didn't think about. And uh, so that uh, those issues that have arisen and nothing really major are being uh, reworked so that we could go out with a, a much larger, probably next week, uh, uh, release, a, a full release to uh, all the, uh, the, the contractors out there. Because right now, there's only a very small handful of uh, con installers that we are aware of that uh, ha that are ready to go and approved and uh, you know for installation. So we're hoping to increase that list so that the uh, potential grantees uh, will have you know know who who they can call and get prices from and that sort of thing. These uh, requests for expressions of 
interest uh, also have them provide their uh, typical prices for say a four, four bedroom home, five bedroom home, six bedroom home. Uh, and then uh, they will be averaged and the people will see what the average prices are. So if they get a price from somebody that's like double that, they know they better shop around a little bit more. Uh, so that's, those are some of the issues that are being dealt with now. The Soil and Water Conservation District, which is the next item on the agenda, sort of ties in with all this. Uh, we have uh, at the district, we, we have a, a, a fairly new uh, district manager. He started in June. And then we've got uh, two new conservation techs that started just in the last month. Uh, and so we've, we've got full staff, the largest staff that's ever had at the district and uh, we've got some great people working on things. So uh, uh, we're in pretty good shape that way. So not much else to report on uh, conservation district. Friends of Cedarmere, uh, as you may know, the uh, Friends of Cedarmere received uh, a very large grant to uh, restore a working water, meal, water wheel on the, uh, uh, the, the historic mill that's on the site that dates to 1862. A lot of work is happening right now. Uh, the, the mill has been, uh, uh, the, the, the wood on the interior, exterior has been uh, recoded. It looks fabulous. Uh, work has been done inside on all the brickwork and on the woodwork. And uh, the millwright was out there today uh, working on uh, designing the, uh, the sluice way that will take the water from the pond over to the, the, the water wheel that's gonna be constructed. Uh, they're actually gonna, uh, the, the, the sluice way has to be made of white oak uh, because that lasts the longest and it's actually cut you know, from trees to order. And uh, it's a big project. And uh, we were hoping to have everything completed by this fall, but uh, that's obviously not happening. Yet. So hopefully by next fall, so. Uh, Eric, yes. this is Kevin from the town. Where'd you get funding for that? Well, we, we had some funding from the Nassau County, uh, the old Environmental Bond Act. Uh, and then that was matched by the, uh, the Robert David Lyon Gardner Foundation, which does a lot of historic preservation work on Long Island. So uh, Yeah, that seems pretty unique. That's what I was asking. Yeah. Yeah, no, we, we, were, we were lucky to get the Gardner Foundation money because they they normally are very adverse to giving any money to uh, to governments. Uh, they feel the, it's it's really the government's responsibility to come up with the money. But uh, in our case, we built a good relationship with them, and uh, they, uh, you know, uh, were able, their director was able to convince the board that this is a good, good and necessary uh, expense. So it's proceeding. It's going to be nice. Uh, if you haven't been down to Cedarmere lately, please go down. Uh, we recently hired a uh, native plant uh, a landscaper to help with some of the invasives and uh, it's really shaping up really nice. So don't wanna go into too much because we've been a long meeting. So uh, <clears throat> I guess that brings us to municipal updates. Uh, Kevin, since you've got the microphone, do you wanna, you wanna start with North Hempstead? Yeah, the uh, town of Northampton doesn't have anything that I'm aware of uh, to uh, provide an update. However, I, in the chat, I did um, post a question on the USGS study, um, if you could address that. Just wondering if it was made available. I don't remember seeing the, the report. I, I, uh, I do have the report. Uh, I did send around a, a, a I think it was a three page, uh, you know, summary of the, the key takeaways which I, I can resend if you'd like. Uh, I, I do have the report. I don't know if, uh, yeah, I did send a link to the report. It's, it's a little too much to try to scan in, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll send that, that link around and my uh, key takeaways uh, to everybody again. Yeah, the, re uh, the presentation was pretty hard to follow for me. Uh, there was some, um, Difficulty, so I'd like to. I'll revisit or look at the uh, points again, and maybe even a report. Thank you. Yeah. It's also, as you know, I recorded this session, so you can go back after tomorrow once uh, it all downloads uh, and, and rewatch their presentation. So and, and go back and rewatch it again if you want to keep going over it. So yeah, on on YouTube, uh, it'll be on our YouTube channel. Yes. Yeah, that's sort of blocked for me, but thank you. Okay. 
Gee, I wonder why, Kevin. <laughs> sorry. Uh, town government. Sorry, 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 sorry. I couldn't resist. Okay. Uh, who wants to go next? I don't have anything, Eric, really. The, uh, the, the mayor hasn't really been involved. So, you know, I know we had our beaches thing going that we talked about. And uh, the mayor's mind's been elsewhere. I assume we'll see him at some point and think about um, you know, kind of reconvening that, which got um, to some interesting things from property taxes to the normal government, the normal garbage, and you know what can what can we do to help ourselves, and what can happen as we've talked about in the past with the giant pieces of debris. Okay. Uh, who else? The, the town of Oyster Bay, we had a successful um, beach cleanup uh, last weekend. It was um, all throughout um, Teddy Roosevelt Park, as well as Beekman Beach, and um, it, it went very well. We had over 300 people attend, um, which we deemed a huge success. Uh, beyond that, I don't believe we have any other updates. Okay. Adam, anything from uh, Roslyn Harbor? Uh, no updates from, from Roslyn Harbor. Rocco, how about uh, Glen Cove? We, um, we have for Crescent Beach, we had the environmental plantings go in uh, late last week and early this week. And uh, so that, that phase of it should be done. Um, we're waiting on the, the other phases to be approved and, and to be done for Crescent Beach. Uh, shifting over to the other side, the East Island Tidal Gates project, that is actually uh, essentially complete at this point. Uh, the gates were done, uh, the environmental plantings are in, and, and that's, that's complete. And that's about it. Okay. Uh, Bruce, uh, how about Seacliff? Bruce still on? Okay. Uh, who else do we have? Uh, I don't know if you have anybody else on. Uh, oh, uh, Nessa County, Dan. Dan on. Hey, Eric. This is uh, Kevin with the Town of North Hempstead again. Uh, just quickly, I I participated in a beach cleanup with Manhattan Bay Protection Committee, and I was wondering. I know Carol does uh, her thing. I was wondering why uh, the committee doesn't necessarily. Uh, get involved to any great extent, uh, basically, you know, you organizing something or something like that, and you ha and nothing's happened in the past. I'm just wondering, uh, is that something we should pursue in the future, or that's just something you rely on other people to do? Well, I mean, I think you answered. I mean, the coalition has really taken the, the ball on that, and, uh, you know, so it's just like with the water monitoring is, you know, if, if they're going to organize it, we'll support it as much as they would like us to, but... Uh, no, yeah, but the coalition always does Oyster Bay. Always, no, no, we don't. I we thought do. you always talk to the beach. We always, oh, I, it's Hempstead Harbor. Yes, we do yes. Captain Beach. We tried doing, unfortunately, because of the pandemic was uh, canceled, we were doing and planning a harbor-wide, I think you may remember, Kevin, harbor-wide cleanup. We were involving Town of North Hempstead Beach Park, and then everything got canceled. And then the International Coastal Cleanup was canceled. So this year we were just trying to get things started up again. So yes, we had the coastal cleanup operating from Tappan Beach. Yeah. In addition, often the uh, City of Glen Cove's Beautification Committee does have a, a cleanup, and then uh, also the Garvey's Point uh, Museum has a has a cleanup, so uh, and there's cleanups going on. I mean, uh, I, I think the ha the harbor is pretty much covered. Okay. All right. Uh, I don't think there's anybody else on. Oh, Dan, uh, Nessa County, anything? Uh, uh, no, nothing. Nothing major to report. I'm just happy uh, the funding came through in uh, September. So. Yep. And thank you, thank you for your help on that. So, no, no any, problem. Anybody have any other business? 
Hearing none, uh, I'll entertain a motion to, uh, to adjourn and just remind everybody our, our next meeting is November 17th and that'll be our last meeting of the year. Uh, so, uh, you know, anybody would like to make a motion to adjourn? I will. Okay. And second? I'll second. second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Happy Halloween. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Good night, guys. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.